Hello everyone and welcome along to the latest edition of the TII podcast. My name's Craig Dennett and I'm joined by Shug Nibbo and Kieran Wallace as we review the Rangers victory in the Scottish Cup semi-final over Celtic, winning 2-1 after extra time. Shug, how are you doing? I'm good mate, really well after the last week, last two games. Absolutely, can't complain. Kieran, how about yourself? Never felt better. I don't think there's been a better um, timing to do a podcast after a game. So, yeah, I feel excellent. It's been a good week. Excellent. So, Kieran, I'll, I'll come to you first. Um, and before we start to sort of dig into the events of of the game itself uh, and the sort of the detail behind the win, it was a really strong uh, performance from Rangers. We couldn't really have asked for much more from the team. Yeah, absolutely not. We came out flying. I think from the first minute, we we looked like we were up to it. I think sometimes you can get a feel for these old firm games in the first 15, 20 minutes, whether or not we're going to show up a lot like the game at Parkhead um, this season, which kind of was a turning point for their season. And it's good to see that we've recovered in that sense. It gives me a wee bit of hope that we can go there and do something now that I think Gio got it absolutely bang on yesterday. Yeah, absolutely. Shug, uh, there was a second of two of the probably most high-profile games of our of our season today anyway um, and both of them went to extra time in the space of 72 hours um, and quite on top on both is, is a great achievement isn't it? Yeah I think that's a huge shout out to the players for every bit of sweat and that, that they played through and a big shout out as well to the backroom staff that had our players looking so fit and they were out running Celtic in extra time even though we had played 72 hours earlier so like so Barcy and Goldson and things that had put in the full 120 minute shifts the other night, doing it again. Fair play to them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Kieran, so we start to, to head into the game. I think um, I think as I as I walked towards Hamden, I was still really calm. Um, I was speaking to Kyle, one of the other podders, and I was like, this is really weird going to an old firm game, not not feeling any nerves, just Feeling really, really calm. I don't know if it was a bit of self-preservation from from my perspective, or I don't know if my expectations of of the of the team had warred a bit, given the exertions they'd put out on on Thursday night. Um, Rangers fans were absolutely on it from from minute one. Um, everyone was talking about when we were leaving the ground and how drained they were of, of energy and all of that kind of thing. They, they really turned up yesterday and spurred the team on. Yeah, I can agree with you more. I had a similar conversation with my cousin walking to the game saying that he was saying, are you nervous going there? And I was like, no, I think after Thursday night, like every bit of nerve in my body was shot to bits. I can remember looking around at the guys I was with on Thursday night and thinking, oh my God, we need to go through this again on Sunday. Um, but in the sense that I think... I don't know the best way to put it, but coming into the game on Thursday, a lot of the questions were, what would you take, a win on Thursday or a win on Sunday? And I was sitting on the fence a wee bit there, and after Thursday, I was like, right, I say to my wife, I've seen my team win leagues, league cups, Scottish cups, a million times over. I'll see it a million times over in my lifetime. Will I ever see another big European final? Sorry, two seconds. Will I ever see a big European final? Um, possibly not. Um Sorry, my dog's absolutely hitting the roof here. So it's just yeah. <laughs> um, we'll ever see a European Cup final? Maybe not. Um, and then when it came to the game, I was like, Celtic, just got out and beat them. Just got out and beat them. And as a Rangers fan, I can't remember many weeks where we've won two massive, massive games like that in, in very good fashion. We're blowing teams away. I thought we were outstanding apart. Over the course of 120 minutes yesterday, I thought we dominated 100 of them. They had their 20-minute spell, and then we had David Snarfield that decided to turn the game on its head. Yeah, absolutely, and we'll get into all of that and all of that detail and that side of things. For uh, Just as we, we start to look at the game, Shug, Gio went with the same team from Thursday night, bar, bar one change. Obviously, John McLaughlin coming in as the cup goalkeeper. Um, I actually quite liked the fact that he, he brought John McLaughlin in. I don't know if that potentially settled any nerves I had as well um, over McGregor, which is a weird thing to say um, from from, from uh, given what Alan McGregor's done for, for us as a team. But, but this season, I don't know if the, that change gave me a wee bit more confidence heading into the game. But um, I don't think he could, he could have dropped anyone from Thursday night if everyone was fit. Yeah, yeah. Uh... 
team on Thursday night did so well that they were going to get the chance, like you say, if they were fit enough, they were going to get another shout because they played so well on Thursday night. And they were all lucky to have to go the 120 minutes really should have killed the game in the 90. Uh, McLaughlin's solid and I see more and more people saying they're quite comfortable with him taking over as number one next season. Yeah. I think so. I think that you'd maybe lose a bit of short stopping with McLaughlin compared to McGregor, but you gain that aerial advantage from McLaughlin. So there's a bit of a trade off, but it was a perfect game for him because apart one shot, he didn't have anything to say. So he didn't have to worry about any short stopping. Yeah, so sure. just I'll stick with you on a on a point from McLaughlin because I know a lot of fans around me when we were first 20, 25 minutes, we were pointing the ball out from the back and obviously trying to draw the, the press from Celtic's front three um, to then allow us to play in behind them and kind of break that press a little bit. It got a bit nervy at times, um, definitely in the stadium. I, I don't know what it looked like on the TV. Um, McLaughlin at one stage let the ball run out for a corner. Fans were getting a bit nervous, but I, I think actually on reflection, it, was a, it, it wasn't as nervy as it appeared at that time. No, it's always because nothing had happened, you hadn't done anything before that, and then that happened, and you're like, oh no. Yeah. But no, it wasn't, it didn't appear to be as nervy, and we didn't seem to control that first half. And I did notice when you're saying about playing out from the back that we sort of completely stopped it. Every single goal kick went long, yeah. uh, which was interesting to see because you're so used to. The two centre halves being either side of the six yard box to get the pass out, and it just and you're used to McGregor then ushering them up when he's kicking it long, but it never happened. They were just straight going long every time, and uh, I think that was, I think that really worked for us as well. Uh, I think we had the height in the midfield with Lundstrom and things, and Celtic sort of aren't the biggest team, so I think it was something to get away from. I think we caused a lot of our own problems against Celtic trying to play out from the back with their press where. Meda and Firashi when they come on and draw all the folk at pace among them. So I think it put out one of their strengths. Yeah, absolutely. Kieran, we know when we play Celtic, we have to press them high, press them fast and press them hard if we're going to have any chance of of, of beating them, really. And we absolutely did that from from minute one yesterday. Um, but one thing that, that was different and, and uh, credit has to go to Gio and the management team was Calvin Bassey's role within the press um, and how he effectively took Celtic's attacking midfielder. It was Tom Rogic first 55 minutes of the game and then Matt O'Reilly for the remainder of the game. But he effectively pushed up into midfield as part of that press and really nullified any threat that Celtic had coming through that avenue. Yeah, I find that quite an unusual tactic. It's not something you see very often where the centre-backs encouraged to push into a centre-mid and leave the gap in behind, but it's obviously something they've been instructed that the full-backs would then come tight and make up almost a back three when Bassey went. I didn't actually pick up on that until the second half. I thought it might have been something that was instructed at half-time, but having watched like some of the highlights back, you can see that it goes and stops them from turning because I've we're well aware from previous old firm games against Rogic, when he gets on that half turn, it's, it begins to create and he's, he's good from range as well. So it was clever from Van Bronckhurst and probably folk watching this will have seen me on it and criticised Van Bronckhurst for a lot of stuff that he's done and been pretty heavy. I got a good slagging for it yesterday, but no, I think tactically, management-wise, timing a subs yesterday, he got it absolutely spot on and... Calvin Bassey has been an absolute revelation this year, and you've seen it yesterday. He was he was men against boys at times, and he's what twenty year old, twenty one year old. He was yeah. fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. Kieran, just sticking with you, first half it felt like we dominated the play. Felt like we were we were in control of possession. We were in control of the chances. I think we created maybe one or two clear cut chances. There was the one I think it was Kent. Um, where he, he hits it wide, I think it was first 10, 15 minutes or so. And then Joe Aribo had a header as well that was cleared um, kind of off the line. It felt like one of those games where we were we were in control, but we weren't really creating any clear-cut chances for ourselves. Yeah, I, I turned around to some of the guys at halftime and I was saying to them, it's almost like once bitten, twice shy. We've seen this movie before, and when I say that, I'm talking about the League Cup final where they scored the offside goal with Julian. 
it almost felt like that again. We were playing that well, we were dominating. There wasn't echoes of them rotating their full backs to, to wingers and putting a lot of pressure on our full backs. It wasn't like that again. And I think most of the credit for me, and it's been the same since the Hearts game with Rimaldum, I think it was 5 0 at Ibrox, that when we have Jack and Lundstrom at centre mid, we just don't look like losing games. We control games from the middle. Um, and we're aggressive when we're out of possession when they, these two are in the team they're an outstanding pair in its centre mid and it showed again yesterday Jack and Lundstrom covered every blade of grass and they didn't give them an inch when there was tackles there to be won these guys were good through and it was great to watch yeah, I'm sorry <laughs> it was <laughs> Shug I'm not sure if you're aware it, it kind of seems to have gone under the radar but Celtic were missing Jack and Marcus yesterday um, so they were they were um, all about pace and I felt like we dealt with their pace really well I, I was actually more confident in dealing with their pace than I was in, in terms of the physicality we've seen from Jack and Marcus in, in previous games uh, as we head into the second half they made a couple of changes they brought on Kyogo and uh, Matt O'Reilly and that kind of signaled the start of um, the sort of 15-20 minute period Kieran mentioned earlier where Celtic uh, came up on top and um, that was the period that they they scored the goal. It was a it was a scrappy goal. I think it's fair to say it was, a, it was a deflected goal. I would go as far as say it was a, it was a lucky goal, but it was a disappointing goal as well from our perspective to lose. What were your views on on the goal and 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 sort of our, the part that we played in it? Yeah, I did sort of worry out that was there a bit of mental fatigue in there because we seemed to just switch off, and it was I guess it was kind of. Like I guess Goldson switching off against uh, Braga in midweek at the corner, trying to organise things. It just we didn't seem to be right on T at that point. Uh, we just switched off from for the short free kick, and consider I think most of our free kicks have been taken short. It really should have been something we're definitely looking out for. And then it's uh, I think I'll say in commentary, it's Greg Taylor's third goal as a professional. Uh, just typical. Came off Barcy. If I hadn't come off Barcy, I think it was straight up uh, at McLaughlin. Uh, it would been interesting if there had been such thing as VAR since uh, for a harsh, he was standing offside and then the goalkeeper's eye line. So VAR might have just uh, cancelled that one out. But of course, we don't look at decisions against that go where they are weird because that's, that's just the way it is. It's only when it's the opposition get a decision in their benefit that we stop questioning officials. But, yeah, no, it was a poor, sloppy goal to lose, but the team reacted in the right way and it's Gio made the two substitutions that seemed to turn it all on its head. In the stadium, it felt like an absolute sucker punch. Um, at, at that stage, I think 63, 64 minutes was was when they, they scored the goal. Um I was really questioning whether we'd have the energy um, to really come back from from something like that. Well, how were you feeling at that stage? I think at that stage, predominantly, the thing I kept saying was we need to score while we've got Roof on the pitch because it looked like he was going to be the man. But once he ran out of legs, I just didn't see where the goal was going to come from at that point. I think it was the only point in the game in which the fans sang um, between then until we scored. Um, but yeah, I felt at the time we need to get a goal while Griff was on the park because I thought it was unbelievable. And for anyone that's played up front themselves in a game of that calibre and that intensity, he run himself into the ground. And this is after the shift they put in on Thursday night. So yeah, at the time, like I said, he basically just felt like the League Cup all over again. They score, they sit in, we still dominate the rest of the game. And they, they did, Arfield's goal just sort of, let a fire under us again and we kicked on from there. We really did play well. And it looked as if we could have maybe nicked it in full time at that point. We we really did play well. And it silenced them. That must have felt like a sucker punch to them almost right back at them. Um, and we did. It was thank the Lord for Scott Arfield. Absolutely. Uh, so just before we come on to Scott Arfield's goal, I just want to touch on Kieran's point and come on Kamar Roof there. Um, he put in an absolute power of work again just after doing the same on Thursday night against um, against Braga. Ten days ago, 11 days ago, we were all questioning, uh, well, is Kamar Roof good enough to lead the line for Rangers? Can we play to his strengths? Can we adapt the team in Morelos' absence to 
to find a way to, to win games such as Thursday night and, and such as Sunday. Um, I think I think I, I think Kamar has done even more than I thought than I thought he could over the last two games. Yeah, I think it's another big, big, big plus point for Gio because he's changed that tactics. Because Kamar Roof's not a Morelos, he can't do everything on his own. And Gio's tweaked them tactics, bringing Barisic in at left back that's going to put that quality into the box and tab on the other side. The likes of, well, it's our field yesterday or Rebo getting into the box, getting players in and around him because Roof will find that space. Even Kins popping up in the box more, I think, at the back post rather than setting out. So I think we've adjusted our tactics to make sure that Roof's not alone. We've always, I think we've almost told players on the one side, get in. If the ball's on the other side, you get in the box. Because Roof is a penalty box. He has that with the post striker that you give him that chance and he'll take it. And I think Roof's did fantastic. Bouncing back, he could easily put his head down after a couple of games and after the old form and things like that. But between him and the management, I think they've got Roof firing. They've got a system that's really working for him just now. Yeah, I have to agree. Uh, Kieran, just before we get to the Arfield goal, and I'm going to come to you first on the Arfield goal, and I'll go to Shug on it. Uh, we got we got away with one. Um, Celtic to the corner, ball k- kind of ricochets around the box again. We've seen that one before, um, and then it fell to Cameron Carter Vickers who smashed it off the crossbar. It felt like we got away, away with one there, but it also felt like a bit of a turning point as well. Yeah, I've got to agree there. Um, it was deja vu all over again for Ibrooks. When it landed, see when the deflection came down, it landed at his feet. I was like, oh no, we've seen this before. And God knows how he's missed it. And he's came back off the bar. But credit where it's due with the set pieces, I think we're on the same boat here. That every time a, a team gets a corner against us, and especially in swinging corners, we're watching it through the gaps in our fingers with our hands in our face because we've not been good. But I think that's the only one, the full game, that I can remember where we didn't really take control and defend it and in the grand scheme of things and how poor we've been from set pieces credit where it's due we handed them well but in that particular moment in the game I think if that was in the net there's no way back for us because the game was hanging finally in the balance there but thank God for the goal post at Hamden they, uh, they won us a cup a few years back if I remember the right hand post twice um, and now the crossbar so maybe the left hand post will do us a favour in the final yeah, well, for fingers crossed. Fingers crossed we don't even need the left-hand post, to be fair. Um, oh, but... That's the last cup final we won. Yeah, So that famous goal at Hamden, one mate, continue. <laughs> um, but just on your point in the set pieces there, Kieran, I think actually I'd give some of that credit to John McLaughlin as well. I think he came out for a couple of the, the um, corners and, and then swinging free kicks early doors. And I think that kind of it gave, it gave the fans a bit more confidence, but I think it seemed to give the players a bit more confidence that he was there to to bail them out if they needed it or give them that that confidence. And it seemed to, like you say, they, they did seem a lot more assured um, with, with cross balls yesterday than they kind of have been in, in recent games. Yeah, I think one of the guys shared it in our chat earlier, um, the compilation, the Pena Cartel account on Twitter put together of McLaughlin and how he was coming for crosses. And the one that sticks in my mind was... In the dying minutes of um, normal time, but it was a corner from either side from Celtic, and he, he feared the worst there. And he's came out, and it's two very strong punches that he's came and claimed. And that's what I've been crying out for. I think we've seen it against Braga with their goalkeeper. He wanted to come and collect everything and really took the pressure off the guys at the back. And that's that's not me having a dig at McGregor, man. We've been so lucky to have a goalkeeper like McGregor throughout the years that's constantly kept us in games and it's hard to sit and criticise him now but it was great to see McLaughlin coming and claiming crosses and I, I think coming into that game when he sees that he's the number one on the team sheet that he's going to start that right I know what I've got to do here I've been crying out for a goalkeeper that's going to come and command these box and collect crosses and really take the danger away from set pieces and he's done he's done brilliant he's done absolutely brilliant and it's great to see yeah Shug, I'm going to come to you first on the Arfield goal, actually. Kieran's, Kieran's hogging the limelight here. Um, so I'm going to come to you first on the Arfield goal. It was a great ball out wide from Connor Goldson. It's a ball we've seen him look for many, many times over over basically this season. Um, Tav kind of tries to hit it first time, squaffs it, 
I think is the best way to describe how he, the ball he puts into the box. But it heads straight towards Kamar Roof and an oncoming Scott Arfield as well. Roof takes a, a, a bit of a bad touch uh, and Scott Arfield's coming in behind to curl it into the into the corner. It was a it was a it was a good move. A wee bit of work in there, but Scott Arfield arriving into the box at the right time and showing that a uh, hundred a hundred balls practice with uh, Roy McKay really works. Yeah, that's a uh, Geo said that on Thursday night that Roy McKay would get some practice with him. So Roy McKay is definitely or 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 he earned his money this week. Uh, I think it's a bit unfair in Tom seeing it as a scruff because I've seen a few people saying that and I'm, I kind of I've watched it again and it's the best place for me to put that ball. Yeah, they try and go across the front of the goal or you pull it back. And the fact that we had Arfield and Roof both there gave them that space. So I'm sure Tom will claim that he definitely meant it. But uh, I would side with him because I think it was it was a great ball in and it's sort of like I say, yeah, they'll go across the front of the goal or you go over there and it worked out perfectly and yeah, brilliant finish from our field. Absolutely brilliant. Yeah. And no doubts that if he got his chance he was gonna take it. That's it. Thursday night was he was just keeping my three one after extra time prediction going on Thursday night. So yeah, I knew I'd full faith in Scotty Arfield to do it and uh, you've got to love the salute because it just winds them up even more. So got to love a Scotty Arfield salute and an old fun match. Yeah, brilliant to see. And the, the Rangers end went absolutely mental. I think I ended up about five rows down from from where I was. Um and the co- confidence from that moment as well just soared. Yeah, I'm head to Tom Bruises myself. I think I was the same. I took a few shots off the seats in front of me and oh, it was absolute bedlam and it hit the net. But touching on the cross that you guys were talking about there, I'm not sure if you've seen online, someone had done like a sort of half and half video. And Roof's first goal against St Mirren was almost a mirror image. It was the sort of long diagonal to Tav from Goldson. He brings it down in the chest and sort of hits it on that half volley across the box to Roof. And it, honestly, it's it, it's like a mirror image. It's like it's been planned. But now you've seen Goldson do that so many times. And it was a wonderful ball out to Tav. But I'll say to shrug on this one. I think that's the best place he could have put it. Because how many times during the game did we see balls going behind and Joe Hart collecting quite comfortably. It was great to put it in there and credit to Kemar Roof. He's an outstanding striker. He's back to goal. It's probably one of the most difficult things that you can do playing up there. And I think Scott Arfield said after the game that thank God for his bad touch because it landed right in his path. And it was an outstanding finish, almost similar to Lundstrom's in the first half that came off the post. If you're going to put it anywhere, it's either side of Joe Hart because he is, he's, he's a big target between these sticks. And yeah, he had no chance with that. And the celebrations were unbelievable. I think we knew then, right, if we're now back in it, kick on and win it. And yeah, we we did. We kicked on after that point. I thought we were excellent after that. Arfield gave us that spark. I think we lost when Ramsey went off the pitch because he gives you the late runs into the box that you almost get a second striker up there. With if that's almost what it feels like. Yeah, Shug, we, like, like Kieran says, we were... Everyone was confident we'd push on from there and, and push towards the victory. I think we kind of huffed and puffed a bit for the last 13 minutes, 14 minutes of, of the game, um, but didn't, didn't really create any clear-cut chances at that stage. Um, I think the, the, the only point that was of concern was the, the two corners that Kieran mentioned that Celtic got in stoppage time. As we head into extra time, were you, did you have any concerns of tiredness at that stage or had the... the the, the different stages of the game and how it panned out, giving you the confidence that we had the energy to to power through. Well, it's funny because I'd said, I was watching it with my mate, and I'd said to him that if I'd been in charge of Sully, I'd have failed at 11 goalkeepers. But if I'd been the way minded, that's what I would have said. Like, I know they're 100 miles an hour from the very start, but I would have said just contain it. And then second half, we're in just tire, go after us. And the fact that the second half, they couldn't get near us, it gave me confidence going into extra time that they're not all that. If they had the energy, they would have been running over us in the second half, and they didn't. So I was pretty confident the fact that we'd been there, done that on Thursday night. 
he'd been to the well once this week, why not go again? So I had confidence and I think when you look at the quality that we had coming off the bench compared to what they were bringing on, I think it shows you the difference in squads. We had internationals coming off the bench, they had youngsters and has and nay next coming off the bench. So <laughs> uh, I was pretty confident that we'd be strong to the finish. Yeah, Kieran, what, what did become very apparent, especially probably in the last five, ten minutes of, of normal time and then the, the first half of extra time was that they were really struggling fitness wise. They were they were um they were all going down with cramp, they were all struggling with, with sort of potential hamstring strains and calf pulling calves and all all sorts. Of, that wasn't something I was expecting to see, and it kind of caught me a bit by surprise. It wasn't, uh, me neither. And I think before the game, we talk about the build-up to it, and you talk about, right, we've went the full 120-plus stoppage. You could almost say 130 minutes on Thursday night. You'd think we would be the team that was like that. And come 90 minutes, when everyone's talking about this game is crying out for Sakala, and people were saying that because they looked, they looked dead in their feet. They looked shot to bits more than we did. I'm surprised there's none of the crazy uh, Celtic bloggers about saying about caffeine levels or anything of the Rangers players uh, this morning. But they they looked a t- more tired team. Our substitutions and the timing of the substitutions really worked in our favour in terms of guys like Kamara, who can be a threat in the final third as much as he can't shoot. He's very good on the ball. He can drift past players. And then Davis controlling the game in behind with Arfield's late runs. We really looked like the team that we're going to kick on and do well. And God knows what Calvin Bassey eats or drinks or, or how he works out, but my God, I've never seen a guy as fit as that in my life. Yeah, he's he's, a, he's an absolute power machine, um, and he, he he was he was up and down um, throughout. Borna Barisic went off just before the the full time in terms of the normal ninety minutes. Dalgan came on, Bassey just seamlessly shifted to left back, um, and he was powering up and down that. That wing, like he was the substitute that just came on. Um, Shug, looking at the first half extra time, it was it was a bit of a non-event. If we're being honest, there wasn't really no, there wasn't. I think Celtic had one kind of cross come short that kind of went across the face of our goal, and um, we didn't really create very much at all. Um, but they, you could tell they were getting more and more tired as as that time went on, heading into the second half of extra time. Um, we we started to to put our, our foot down on their neck as such. Um, and our, our, real fir- our first real chance, it was kind of three chances in the space of about five seconds, I think. Um, it was a cross ball from Tav that, that Joe Hart saved. Um, and then I think it was Tav again that followed up with a, and hit the post. And then Passion Sakawa with a, an ambitious overhead kick attempt that, that hit the crossbar. It felt like we were doing everything but scoring, didn't it? Yeah, I did. Uh, although I was, I was confident. Us, I did, I did lose a wee bit of optimism when we took, we'd taken Barisic and we'd taken Roof off, because I was like, well, that's two more penalty takers. Yeah. Both being first choice penalty takers in the past, and then when Roof and Barisic went off, I was like, oh, oh that's two more first three penalty takers gone. Uh, looking around, but yeah, no, it was, it was a great chance and. Yeah, it, it did feel like that was our chance. That was going to be our chance in extra time. And when we didn't take it, I was almost kind of hoping for penalties at that point. And I was literally looking around the field deciding who was going to be on penalties and that sort of way, thinking, well, Tar will take one. And then it's like, well, who else is going to take one? And you just get in that mindset during the game and you're like, yeah, it's time's ticking on now. But yeah. Thankfully, we didn't need to worry about that. Yeah, absolutely, Kieran. I don't think I could have coped with penalties um, in that environment yesterday. And, and thankfully, we didn't have to. Three minutes after those chances, um, we were we were celebrating again. I think it was a quick free kick uh, down the left-hand side. Ball got to Davis, who passed it to Kent. Kent did really well driving, driving at their defence again. Bassey absolutely powering through on the overlap. I think he... He, he beat James Forrest by about 30 yards um, from, from an equal stand and start. Um, he, he was, his hand was offside, but um, he, he still managed to get the ball across. And um, Fashion Sakawa did really well to, to try and, and, and uh, come across at the, at the, um, the centre of the goal. Um, 
and it, it kind of forced Carol Starfelt to take a swipe at the ball and, and it found its way into the side net and it was 2-1 Rangers. Yeah, unbelievable desire to get forward and support. And how many fullbacks do you see that can make a, an overlapping run like that and the dying minutes extra time in a game that's been like a basketball game almost, like the full game? And credit, like I said previously to Basti, he must have went full tilt for the best part of 250 minutes across three days. And to go beyond Kent, I don't know if any of you guys seen for the stands, Kent was Kent was out on his feet. It, it, I think that's what you call emptying the tank. That last bit to sort of drive. I don't know why it ended up Stephen Welsh at right back, but he's driving towards Welsh, isolates him for the two on one, and it's a great slip ball to Bassey down the line, and it's a fantastic cross. I think just before that, um, I can't remember who it was that hit the byline. He's tried to be quite cute with it. It might have been Barisic. I think it was Did Barisic, it? yeah. Yeah, almost similar situation where he's hit the byline, he's trying to be too cute and pick the pass out. Whereas Bassey, what we touched on earlier with tabs crossed for the other side, he's trying to go in behind the centre back with it because he's committed front post. And it's Sakala's done brilliant. First rule, first rule of there when a cross is coming in for the strikers to get across him and hit that front post area to make the defender think. And I think if he doesn't do that, it's a comfortable clearance for Starfield, but it doesn't. Starfield panics and it's luckily for us it comes off him and into the net and it was deserved. There was no other result that I don't think was deserved in a Rangers win there. And the scenes after it, that's the type of scenes that live with you forever. And the place was unbelievable. It was bedlam for their players as well. I know we've got a lot of players in limbo with contract um, issues, the likes of Goldson, even young guys like Lowry out there. There's no way they can't just look at that and say, I'm, I'll not get this anywhere I go, despite how much money I make. There's nothing that compares to that. Yeah, Shugga, you have to agree. We'll talk about Conor Goldson in a second, but the uh, the scenes after that ball hit the back of the net were something to behold, weren't they? Yeah, uh, definitely. Uh, I actually thought Barcy was going to be joining the crowd. I can't believe we had the energy to hope the advertising boards had run over the crowd. I say I think he went he the full just... length of the line there, uh, uh, Hugh, but he's actually went the full length of the pitch and then over the advertising boards and into the West Stand, so more credit uh, with it's due. I would say I'm maybe a bit a bit for a skunk. Keep running, keep running <laughs> all the way through. Bit unlucky to be booked for that. Uh, but, yeah, no, it's, it seems so phenomenal and I can't say it was absolutely no less than what we deserved. We were brilliant throughout and the effort that the players gave the whole 90 and 120 minutes. It was just unbelievable not that you see him and Barcy and Forrest in the replay, you see them they're both starting from the exact same spot and they take off and I don't think Forrest is a slouch, but Barcy just left him for dead and now it's Barcy after say nearly 250 minutes including injury time, so he was definitely unbelievable from Barcy and he has a machine and I'm pretty sure he eats children or something for breakfast because <laughs> he's just <laughs> unbelievable. And I know sitting where I do eyebrows eye down at the touchline and you see him in the person and he is just, he's absolutely mammoth and yeah, he, he looks more a rugby player than a footballer but he's absolutely unbelievable and yeah, I'd like to see him getting a new contract and getting recognised as a first-team pick now that he is. Yeah, I wanted to... We've spoken a lot about Calvin Bassey on this podcast, and, and rightfully so. I wanted to pull out a couple of other other players that, that played well or perhaps came in from the cold and we, we, we didn't necessarily expect to see as much of, but still put in a shift and put in a performance. Um, so the first one I want to touch on is, as you said, Kieran Connor goldson I thought with... Um, with Calvin Bassey pushing into the midfield as part of that press, it put, puts a lot of pressure onto his shoulders in terms of being able to handle the, the man through the middle. And I thought he did that expertly and he dealt with any anything that, that Celtic threw at them at him throughout the full game. Yeah, for the second time in a week, I thought it was colossal. It was brilliant. We really need to get the checkbook out and throw it at him. We need to keep him. I had a, a discussion with someone yesterday that how much it would cost us to replace a guy like Goldson. And that's not just for what he gives you on the park as a football player. It's what he's gave us over the past, is it four years? Am I right in saying that? He's been yeah. here, man. 
over four years. Um, statistically, I think he's only missed five games out of the games that he could have been available over a 200-game period. That's unheard of nowadays. Sports science and stuff like that, where you pull guys out of the team and rotate to give them rest. We don't seem to have to be doing that with him. So not just on that, he's a leader on the park as well. He shows that he is a good vice-captain and he represents Rangers very well. There's no sound bites in interviews or press conferences or anything like that. And On his interview yesterday after the game, he came out and he said that in the dressing room at halftime, they admitted we will get tired, but tired is only a mentality. It's all in your head. Go out and empty the tank and we'll deal with that after the game. We'll get the next week to recover. And that's the kind of guys you need in the dressing room. If we're going to be missing guys like McGregor come the end of the season, Davis, we've already lost the four. Maybe a chance we'll lose Arfield. We need leaders in that dressing room that have got experience of being here and doing it at Rangers. And he's the first guy there for me. We've got to do everything we can to keep him. I don't know if on a personal level that's possible, but financially we need to do everything we can to keep Bernard Goldson. Yeah, yeah, to be fair, he, he did give one sign bite out in the season at the Hibs Cup semi-final, but we'll let him off with that one now. Thanks, uh, we'll let that one slide. <laughs> we'll let that one slide now. Shug, I, I have to agree with Kieran. We, we need to do all we can to, to keep Connor Goldson. If he, if personally he's decided he wants to move back to England or closer to family or whatever, then we can't really do anything about that, but we need to try everything in our power to, to keep him for next season and beyond. Yeah, no, 100%. He, he's just... I mean, we, we've benefited from the Bosman and getting John Lundstrom, who I'm sure we're going to talk about, but Lewis and Goldson is similar to Sheffield United. Lewis and Lundstrom, it's just been massive. Yeah. I'm sure the club are working on everything, and I know they've got their wage structure and things, but he should be at the very top. I think we said in a pod a wee while ago that he should be at the very top, as much as I love Morelos. Goldson is the man that should be at the very top of that pay structure and he leads us so well, never misses games and it's not even just his diagonal passing out with him from the back it's just such a weapon and yeah I'd be doing everything and if he needs to, if he wants to go home because he's missing home or whatever then you can't argue but he'll never play for a club as big as us again and it's, I don't well, maybe not the biggest payers in the world, but you're certainly not a poor man when you finish a contract at Rangers. So I'd hope that it's not, oh no, I'll come down to money and it's his ambitions. I mean, that European night, well, it must have been the Dortmund night as well. He was emotional. And then that cup semi finals. So hopefully, hopefully that just pulls him that little bit close that I signed in that deal. Yeah, absolutely. Fingers crossed, Shug. I'm just going to stay with you. You mentioned John Winstrom there. Um, again, Use the word that Kieran used there to describe um, Connor Goldson. John Winstrom has been absolutely colossal for us in the last in the last week, but obviously in, in, in many of our games beforehand from, from Dortmund onwards, um, he's been a huge performer for us. It's good to see that he he almost hates them as much as we do, um, which is which is always good to see. He, he was very much up for the battle um, yesterday and he, he led from the front and he absolutely dominated that midfield. Yeah, it's, it's not a phrase that I like using a lot of them, but he gets it. He absolutely gets it. And he's just, don't know if it's because he's scouts or he, he's, so, uh, he's from a similar sort of background as Glasgow. Uh, I don't know if that plays into it, but he absolutely gets it. And he's grown in his time with Rangers. If you'd have said to me back in January that he's leaving to go somewhere else, I'd have been pretty much known first. He had a good spell at October time and then he just didn't see him getting into the team before the winter break. Yeah. But since then, and even since he's got back into the team, he's just been man of the match most games. I love when you see him getting bossy to stop apologising for giving away a foul, just grabs him and it's like, no, in this game, we don't apologise for nothing. Yeah. When he rattled it, he Sorry, I into that. Apologise for nothing, unless you're um, is it a, is a Celtic player that apologised to him after he went right through? Hatati, uh, Hatati <laughs> apologised to him. <laughs> yeah, he was going to give him cheek, and then realised that now he's standing a bit ahead above you. So I don't think he's wanting to give you cheek. Uh, but yeah, he's 
him and Jack in that midfield, they are two players there that understand everything about the club and they're two leaders and they absolutely the two of them dominated that midfield and gave Celtic nothing. He chased them down everywhere. And yeah, and but for the some the width of the paint or whatever on the post, they would have had a absolutely phenomenal goal as well to go along with it. So I think he offers that as well that we've seen him have a couple of good strikes in his time already. So hopefully he can get forward and get more strikes off and add that to his game because it's probably the one thing we've missed for a long time as a midfielder that's getting double figures. So I think he's capable of it in Scotland. So yeah, absolutely, absolutely delighted with him and his performances. Yeah, Kieran, it's been some turnaround since since January uh, in terms of John Winstrom and, and fan opinion on him. He's absolutely got to be one of the, the key powers we build the, the team around next season, doesn't he? Uh, I couldn't agree more. You touched in January there. This is, we're only talking about a few months ago and there was talk of him going out and loan because Gio didn't fancy him. And uh, that, would, that blows your mind in hindsight, I think, because he has been unbelievable and Almost like you said, he gets it and we get him. And I think that's why we like him so much. And he's a great example of young players. He had a great youth career coming through in England and then sort of fell away at Everton, fell down the leagues to teams like Scunthorpe and Oxford, if I'm correct. Um, worked his way back up, Premiership football player, and now he's a fan's favourite at Rangers in the semi-finals of the Europa League, a Scottish Cup final. And... Let's be honest, in yesterday's performance, this league title's not over yet. Um, so it must be absolutely loving it. But when you see all the wee sort of compilations of his best bits from yesterday, like being a leader in the middle, not shirking out of any tackles at all, being right in the face of them. There was a back and forward with him and McGregor at one point where he's went through McGregor and they've had a bit of a square go and then it's came to the corner and he's the one that's picked up McGregor again. So he really fancies it when the chips are down and that's why we love him. And I think the same goes for Bassey, like we said earlier. He's a powerhouse that gives you 100%. Both of them are. They're not pulling out attackers and that's what we love at Rangers. Guys like that that are going to leave everything that they've got on the pitch and John Lynch epitomises that. He's an absolute powerhouse. Yeah. I can't disagree with any of that. I'm just going to pick out one more player from yesterday. Um, it may not be a player either of you are expecting me to pick out, but Scott Wright, I thought, played a big role yesterday. He also played a, a bigger role on Thursday night than I think any of us thought he was going to play. Um, I actually thought he did really well when he came on. Um, he, he, he's a player that has his limitations when it comes to his final ball, but I think I thought the way he linked up the play yesterday and he moved into space, taking the ball from, from out wide, from Barisic or from Tav, and, and then linking and then switching the play was really good. Shug, I, 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 I don't think any of us were expecting Scott Wright to, to come on for Aaron Ramsey when, when, when um, that substitution had to be made. But I thought, he, I thought he did well when he came on and he played his part. Yeah, I think it's it's almost exactly, it's somewhere between a Ramsey and a Sakala. He's got he's the he's the in between, I guess. Uh, that he's not obviously he doesn't sit, but he's got a bit of pace, but he's not got the colour pace. Uh, and his end product maybe isn't great, but it's still probably better than Sakala's. But no one as good as Ramsey, so he's definitely in the middle of the two. Uh, and he, he he did well out on that side, and I did notice he was drifting in quite a bit, and he was he was showing up as that man. He was happy to receive the ball inside and things and uh, he's another one he's a, he's a good squad player he's he's never going to be a first 11 player for Rangers uh, but if he's happy then I'll get no qualms with him being there and he does offer that something a little bit different and he uh, don't want to sound derogatory but he's like a poor man's kent in many ways he offers the same sort of thing as kent just not not on the same level. He's happy to take that ball in and he'll keep going and he'll go at them again and again and he offers that threat down that side. So, yeah, no, definitely happy to see Scott Wright playing well. Yeah, Kieran, he was, a, he was actually a player who I thought was potentially paving a way out of Rangers this summer. I think he was one of the players that 
we hadn't seen for a number of months. Uh, we didn't really see a way back into the team for him, but he's he seems to have come back into the fold a bit with Gio in the past few weeks. Yeah, 100% agree with you, Craig, and I was actually going to say that. I think at the start of the season, I don't know if you can recall, but there was a period where Kent was about out for about six weeks with a hamstring injury. Our right wing slot was crying out for someone just to come in and claim it, like put your, above, put your head above the pit and just claim that position. And he was the man, he, was, he should have been the man that came in and kicked on and took his game to another level. Because remember when Kent signed a long time ago, and uh, a few years ago, sorry, and he was kind of up and down in form, that young player that looked like he could do something, but could he take his game to the next level? And that's what we expected of Scott Wright this year, and he's not really kicked on, but like we spoke about, he came on the other night on Thursday night, a very, very big surprise of a substitution, because and again on uh, yesterday, because when you look at Ramsey going off, you're thinking, right, our fields are like for like change. Again, it's a centre mid who can play out wide that will give you the late run into the box and keep the possession ticking over when neat and tidy passing. But again, Geo's went with a bit of a shock and brought right on. And like you said, he's quite happy to go inside and take the ball. And he's fantastic on the turn. And the last thing you want is a centre back or a defender is someone dropping in behind the midfield. Well, their midfield and running out of defence. And he done great yesterday. There was, I had a Rangers da, so he speaks sitting behind me yesterday that slaughtered him. And I was thinking, you can't be watching the same game as me here. Like like you said, Craig, a wee bit of a shock for this to be mentioning him. He didn't, it wasn't a complete standout by any matter of means, but he came on, he done his job and he made it hard for them. He really did give us that bit more going forward, a bit of pace and, there was times in the game where, and this isn't a criticism, it's an actual thing that Ramsey would come back and drop in the way a centre mid would instead of going and hitting the byline and giving Tav more space to go in front of him. And Wright started to give us that. He started to pin their full back, um, Juranovic it was at the time. He started to pin him back and give Tav more space in front of him because of his pace. And it was good to see. It's worked. Definitely yeah. has. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I wouldn't be surprised if we see a bit more of them um, to go into the, the remainder of the season as well. Just one last point before I ask you to pick your, your, your man of the match um, for the game yesterday. Um, the post-Rangers win meltdowns from, from Messrs Sutton, Hearts and, and Thompson are well underway. Um, and that they're always kind of a bit like the icing on the cake, aren't they, after a, after a Rangers win. Um, Bobby Madden is the is the target for the IR um, this time around. Um, I, I don't think Bobby Madden had a great game yesterday, but I don't think he decided the game either way at all, Shug. No. Uh, it's uh, it's funny because there's been no mention the referee in the last two old forms or Glasgow derbies because uh, I wonder why. I don't know. I don't know what was different yesterday to the last two. Maybe the team that won, maybe the opposition winning is uh, a bit troublesome. They've got to find something. But like you say, he's, he was poor. He's a poor referee. He's the same as I say with Willie Cullum. There's absolutely no doubt in my mind that they're not biased in any direction whatsoever. They're just poor referees. There's a reason why we don't see them in Champions League duty and things like that. It's because they're not very good. Uh, it's something that Scottish football really needs to fix. Got to make referees full time. Yeah, God forbid what happens with VAR comes in if it comes, gets voted through because yeah, who's going to be in control of that more poor referees but he was poor I mean McGregor should have been booked first he should have been the first one booked so that's when there was the one with most of Bobby Madden's fault but there's the one where they get through and they get the shot away and then, I think it was Maeda was like three yards offside it was as clear as day so I mean we had legitimate reasons to even the free kick that led to that goal was never a free kick. So it was legitimate reasons on both sides. And I can see them getting upset that, yeah, maybe we could have had a book in here or there. But it's just, he's just a poor referee, so they can go on all they want. But that wasn't the reason why Rangers won yesterday. Nowhere near it. Yeah, and you can almost set your watch by it, can't you? You can, you could see it coming a mile off. Yeah, absolutely. And what Shug said there, there was no complaints the past two games. 
Um, one decision in the game which struck me is very similar to one that we've seen before. Um, there was a head knock from a corner which Madden seemed to stop pretty quickly. And it's funny we didn't see that at Parkhead and there was any complaints when Aribo went down the head knock and they scored their first goal from. Um, Madden had a poor game and I couldn't, I was going to say that I couldn't believe they were complaining after the game about a referee, but I couldn't believe that they were claiming and blaming the referee when some of the decisions that went against us, like like you said, uh, you're the one with me there, but it was a good three yards offside, I was up the other end of the ground and even I could see that and I don't know if that comes down to the linesman, but it was, it was a shocking decision, the one with the free kick like you mentioned as well. Surely the referee has got to be savvy in that situation that a centre-back that's run himself out of position, almost into a danger zone, is about to lose the ball and throws himself to the ground. It's, it's out of sheer panic he goes down. And you watch the highlights back, you see it on TV and you see it as we've seen it in the stadium. It's not a free kick, which then leads to a goal where there's an offside player impeding the keeper's view. I'm not going to sit here and get torn up and say the ref's fault is here and the ref's fault is there for either team. I thought it was poor for both teams, but I sympathise with my wee bit because we talk about VAR coming in and we'll see Celtic's true colours tomorrow when the vote happens. The, the referees do need help. Like they're part-time referees. I've heard that in other podcasts where we talk about these part-time referees and they've got other jobs. A lot of them are lawyers, solicitors, I think. Bobby Madden's quite high up in the firm that he deals with as well. Do you think they can really be asked with all the criticism that comes with refereeing in this country on the back of the job that they already do? Like, make them full time, give them the backing that they deserve because it can't be an easy job in a goldfish bowl, which is the old firm and play a league like the SPFL. It's a difficult job and they need all the backing that they can get because the standard isn't great, but they've not got the backing there behind them that will help them. Do we think Celtic won't ever blame a referee again if VAR comes in? <laughs> Absolutely not. It's, it's still going to happen. They'll be claiming it's the VAR rooms or Masonic meetings and all the rest of it. I know how they work by now, so it's, I don't know, it's the same old story over and over again with them and the pile on as well. The last time Sutton and Hartson done this, Beaton get his windows panned in and needed uh, security around the clock. So it's it's just getting ridiculous now. Yeah, absolutely. And for, and for, for people employed by major TV companies as well, um, that are th- sort of broadcasting throughout the UK, you, you would expect a much a much better standard of, of behaviour and, and you would expect them to be held to that standard, standard of behaviour as well. Okay, just to tie up, this podcast and um, and the game itself. Shog, I'm going to come to you if you're a man of the match, first of all. Uh, I want to give it to every single player that was on the pitch, but I think John Nunstrom for me, I think just ahead of Barzi, I think Nunstrom just absolutely nullified them in midfield and he was just a controlling pre- presence throughout and his use of the ball was good and breaking up every single attack from them. It was really good. There was even the one when he came back and he, he strolled into our box and took it away when they, there was a wee bit of danger down the, our right, our left-hand side and he almost like walked back into the box, but it was a brilliant interception from him. and He was just great at both ends and whisked away from net in the first. So, yeah, John Lindstrom, I think, shades it for me. Eden, what about yourself? Um, it's a tough one, isn't it? Um, but I'm going to give mine to the team. And when I say the team, I mean the Celtic media team, because what a laugh they've gave us. <laughs> if it's not claiming that we're the opposition or every po- every picture that went with a post to do with the game, being one of their players being fouled to create a conspiracy and a, a, a storm a teacup amongst their fans, um, it's them then complaining that they've not had a large fish. So, yeah, what a laugh they've gave us. So, I'm going to get to the Celtic media team because it makes it that wee bit sweeter. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll take that one. Um, I'm going to give it to Calvin Bassey. Um, I think I think he was he was immense throughout yesterday. I think I think we've spoken about the, the merits of his of his performance at length um, in this podcast. Um, but I, I think it's you could pick what you could pick one to eleven yesterday, and and they probably all be deserving of, of of that kind of accolade. 
Um, so I think that's us. I think we've, we've ran on a bit longer than we normally do um, on these review podcasts. But when it's a big game and a performance like that, you just have to, to pick it apart and, and give yourself the time to do that. Shug, thanks oh, very much for joining us. No worries. I've got to also say a special mention to Alfredo Morelos for still being controversial. <laughs> Things don't how much he hates them. Even when he's sat in the stand, he's still upsetting them. Love that guy. He's my man of the match. <laughs> and Kieran, thank you very much for joining us as well. Oh, it's my pleasure. Like I said at the start of the show, there's been no better time to take part in one of these pods. Um, fantastic day yesterday. Fantastic week to be a Rangers fan. And thoroughly enjoyed it. Long may continue. Absolutely. Thank you very much, everyone, for listening. All that's left for me to do is to ask you to uh, like the video, subscribe to the TII YouTube channel, and remember to turn on the notifications so you get an email every time we upload a new podcast. Thank you very much for listening, as I said, and until next time, goodbye.